Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Taylor Hudak. Today we are joined by returning guest, Dr. Sheer Hever. Dr. Sheer is an independent economic researcher and a journalist at The Real News Network. Today he explains to us the ongoing situation in Gaza as well as Israeli occupation in Palestine and how Israeli domestic politics plays a role in this ongoing crisis. Dr. Shear, thank you for joining us today and welcome back to The Source. Thank you, Tina. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that Israeli domestic politics has on the recent attacks in Gaza? The Israeli polit political system and the crisis in the Israeli political system is the actual reason for the current uh, cycle of violence, uh, which is something that started with four consecutive elections in Israel not reaching any kind of uh, decisive victory for any side or the other. The reason for that is that all of the Israeli political parties have become very tribal. Uh, the identity politics that each party has to be loyal to their own group of voters created a situation in which parties know if they sit together and form a coalition, uh, their voters would not forgive them for agreeing to sit with their political opponents. And now uh, in the most recent election in March, Netanyahu again did not get enough of a, of a majority and uh, he tried to form a coalition government and failed. And as soon as he failed, uh, the option to try to form a coalition government passes on to the opposition. And that's when Netanyahu started uh, creating provocations, first in Jerusalem and then in Gaza as well. And this created a state of emergency and a very strong sense of, of panic and uh, ultranationalism and racism and incitement in the Israeli political system. Under these conditions, the Israeli parties cannot unify because if they unify, it would send a message of, of compromise. And uh, if there's and if Palestinians are allowed to sit in the government, then uh, they will be called Arab lovers, they will be called uh, not patriotic, patriotic enough. That's what Netanyahu was banking on, and that's exactly how uh, the crisis played into his hands. We're speaking on Friday, and uh, there's been a, an agreed ceasefire between the Hamas party and the Israeli government. Uh, everyone is hoping that the ceasefire will hold, but there is a disconnect between the way that this ceasefire is described by the Hamas party and by the Israeli side. Hamas is saying, it's a ceasefire that includes an Israeli obligation to stop provocations in Jerusalem. While the Israelis are saying there's no such uh, obligation. And as we are speaking, there is a, a large demonstration around the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, uh, not far from there, where large numbers of Israeli police are using um, rubber coated steel bullets to try to disperse the Palestinian demonstrators. And that makes the whole ceasefire very fragile. Uh, if people are hurt, there would be a very good reason for uh, the Hamas party to say the ceasefire has been broken by the Israeli side. And that would once again help the Israeli government, especially Netanyahu, to say, oh, look, uh, uh, Hamas is accusing us of breaking the ceasefire, but actually it's them who are breaking the ceasefire and fighting will resume. In many ways, every Israeli knows that uh, what Netanyahu did here, this kind of trick of, of creating a war, or not exactly a war, but, a, but certainly a very bloody exchange of violence, is something that serves his political gains, its short-term political gains. And uh, as of now, 12 Israelis were killed in the exchange, more than 200 Palestinians. But if it means that uh, this, the right of Israel, Israel to defend itself means to sacrifice also Israeli citizens for short-term political gains of a certain politician or another, then of course the, the statement has, has lost all meaning. The German discourse about this is completely hollow. When German politicians say Israel have a right to defend itself, they don't mean that. They just have to say something in order to make a pretense that they are not anti-Semitic because, uh, sadly, the German political institutions are, have, have lost the ability to distinguish between Jews who were, uh, who were the descendants of uh, the victims of the Holocaust and the state of Israel, where not everybody is Jewish. Uh, but... Um, it's a very cynical situation in which German politicians would just say these nothings 
like uh, uh, Israel has, a, has the right to defend itself. Of course, Palestinians do not have a right to defend themselves. And then, of course, they can proceed to say whatever they want. For example, they don't like demonstrations against the uh, invasion of Gaza, the bombardment of Gaza. They uh, don't like it when uh, refugees or migrants come to Germany and they have also political opinions. They don't like it when German Jews don't follow the line and say that they are also very pro-Israeli. Uh, a lot of German Jews, such as myself, uh, are very critical of the uh, pro policies with the Israeli government and the um, war crimes committed by the Israeli military in Gaza. So uh, in order to try to silence all of these voices, they're using these, these statements. Uh, but let's, let's be very clear. Israel as a state has no rights. States have no rights. No state in the world has any kind of rights. Only people have rights. People have a right to live. People have a right to exist. If the Israeli government wanted to protect its citizens, they could, of course, have um, ended occupation, allow, respected international law, and allowed Palestinians uh, to live in peace and in security. And if they had done that, then they would have a very strong argument uh, to say that Palestinians should not use any kind of violence because they don't have a reason to. And uh, because they're not doing that, they are putting the Palestinian population in a situation that they either live under Israeli control without any rights or they fight for their freedom. Uh, so that is not protecting their citizens. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the causes. Another topic that has received little attention is Israel's settlement expansion into the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Can you tell us about this neighborhood and why it is critical for the Israeli government? Sheikh Jarrah is a very special case. There are so many places in, in the whole area of Israel-Palestine where Jewish colonists are trying to uh, remove the local population, take over Palestinian homes and, and land and so on. But Sheikh Jarrah is special. And the reason is that uh, there are uh, colonists who claim that they, they should own the houses in which currently Palestinian families live, Palestinian families who are themselves refugees, because uh, the, those houses were owned by Jews before the 1948 war. And as a result of the 1948 war, the war in which uh, the state of Israel was created, uh, they uh, lost those houses and now they want them back. And this argument is very, very explosive. Uh, I've been demonstrating in Sheikh Jarrah myself already 12 years ago. So it's, it's a, an ongoing story. And I really felt strange in those demonstrations uh, 12 years ago because usually you see you see your usual friends, people who are uh, active on Palestinian rights. But in Sheikh Jarrah, we had also people demonstrating with us who were liberal Zionists, who were not interested in Palestinian rights at all, but said, if uh, the colonists are able to take these houses from Palestinians using the argument, they lost this property in the 1948 war. What are we going to do when millions of Palestinian refugees are going to say, oh, we've also lost some houses and land and property in Israel in the 1948 war? We want it back using the same legal precedent. So this story in Sheikh Jarrah has divided the Israeli public as well, not just the, um, caused this division between Palestinians and Israelis. And in it created this precedent. Now, in effect, the Israeli court has already made its decision. The court said only Jews can get historical justice, but Palestinians no, which means that uh, those families pretty much certainly are going to be um, deported from their homes very violently. And uh, but the court did the, the Supreme Court of Israel did notice that the decision that they were going to publish about uh, removing these uh, families from their homes comes just at this juncture in which Netanyahu failed to form a government and now the opposition tries to form a government and uh, that if they would publish their uh, verdict, it would play into the hands of Netanyahu because it will create a, a lot of violence in Jerusalem and a lot of anger. So they said, we're going to defer the decision by 30 days. It's not a co coincidence that they said 30 days. 30 days is the amount of time that the opposition has to form a government. So the court did a very political thing, trying to prevent Netanyahu from using the, the crisis uh, to his own purposes. But Netanyahu is just smarter than the court and was able to create the crisis anyway by sending uh, some very right-wing uh, provocateurs into Sheikh Jarrah 
and then uh, sending the police into Sheikh Jarrah to attack people and injure hundreds of people. Who is profiting from this recent attack on Gaza domestically as well as externally? Certainly Netanyahu is the big profiter because Netanyahu is facing corruption uh, uh, charges in a trial that is not going his way at all. Uh, but uh, he, he knows that as long as there is a state of emergency, nothing can be done to him. And he can always say, uh, until this thing clears up, I have to stay the prime minister. Now, all he has to do is hang on until June 2nd. And if by June 2nd, the opposition cannot form a majority government, he stays prime, as prime minister and there will be a fifth election round. So that's very clear who, who makes the most short term immediate gains. In the long term, I think that the Hamas party makes a very, very important gain in comparison to other factions within the Palestinian public. That's something that needs to, to be very clear. And this is something that takes us back directly to German politics as well, because we see a lot of different factions among Palestinians and political parties and movements are saying we have different ways to fight for our freedom, to fight for justice and, and equality. Uh, and they want to use the boycott movement, for example, by, and civil disobedience and, and protests. But Hamas is saying consistently, all that will not work. The only way to defeat Israel and, and the Israeli occupation is with force of arms. And now they have uh, responded to the Israeli provocations in, in Al-Aqsa and in Sheikh Jarrah in uh, Jerusalem by saying, we're going to fire rockets and their rockets have been more effective than before. And that puts to shame a lot of Palestinian organizations that are using nonviolent methods. In the long term, Hamas would be able to say, look, our violence works better. And this is very concerning. And the reason that I say this is connected to what's happening in Germany is because the German political institutions cons consistently reward Hamas for violence, but punish Hamas for trying to uh, curb violence. When the Hamas party published a document which effectively recognizes the state of Israel and recognizes the fact that Palestinians uh, should have a right to negotiate with the Israeli government on uh, an equal basis, meaning that uh, Hamas does not have the right to, to uh, sabotage these negotiations, for example. And they said that, uh, that they have no problem with Jews, but only with the occupation. This document did not help the Hamas party uh, be, be taken off the list of terror organizations in the European Union, did not convince the German government that uh, Hamas should be recognized as a negotiation partner. And, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Hamas. I don't support them by any stretch of the word. And uh, I have friends who were killed by Hamas attacks. So there's no, there, I'm not going to be convinced uh, to support Hamas uh, as opposed to other political groups in, in Palestine that I do uh, support very much. Uh, but I think that uh, now that we saw this um, disgusting display of a, a German um, solidarity demonstration with the state of Israel, when the state of Israel has uh, conducted an attack on the Gaza Strip. And this is a they could have had this, this demonstration of solidarity with the state of Israel also a month ago, but they didn't. They waited until the, the Israeli army killed 200 Palestinians, 40 children. And, and then they said, we stand in solidarity with the state of Israel. Um, so that sends a message to Hamas. If you want the German government to recognize you and to consider you as a serious organization, you have to kill more people. That, I, I don't see how you can interpret that message in another way. So I think uh, uh, the German politicians need to be held accountable for this message that they're sending. And we will get to more on that just a little bit later, but I do want to talk about the United States role in all of this. And I want to ask you about President Biden's policy so far. Does it differ in any way from the Trump administration or is this just more of the same? Right now, when we are seeing the ceasefire that has been put together, uh, there's a lot of rumor that the ceasefire was orchestrated by Biden. I don't see any evidence that actually confirms that. And Netanyahu himself said that he's used the Egyptian offer of a ceasefire, not the American. Uh, and there's been very little coming out of the Biden administration. It's not the same as the Trump administration in terms of the language, uh, because Trump 
consistently made uh, very anti-Palestinian statements and basically uh, didn't recognize the right of Palestinians to live. While Biden did say that uh, um, af in the aftermath of the, um, this, this uh, uh, Israeli attack on Gaza, it's not, uh, he's also going to spend some money to help uh, rebuild uh, parts of the Gaza Strip that have been destroyed by the Israeli army. So it is, of course, a statement that says, I'm going to clean up after Israel. I'm part of the Israeli uh, attack machine. But on the other hand, it also recognizes to some extent that Palestinians are human beings and deserve basic things like, like drinking water. But I think uh, that one thing that hasn't really been reported a lot is what happened just before the Israeli elections in March. Weeks before the elections, the Israeli government gathered for an emergency session to approve two massive armed deals with the United States for the purchase of F-35 airplanes and, and also for replacing the entire fleet of Israeli attack helicopters of the military. This is not needed for military reasons. This is not that the Israeli military said we urgently need to buy more American weapons right now, especially not these particular weapons. but this, these two deals that are measured in billions of billions of, of dollars have been passed somehow through the Israeli budget, you know, that because there is no uh, majority government, it's, it's impossible to pass any kind of budget, but they still passed this deal by taking loans because it creates a situation in which the Pentagon is now beholden to the Israeli government. It means that uh, the arms industry in the United States is telling Biden, don't do anything uh, that that would undermine the Israeli um, assault on Gaza and the, and their imperialistic expansionist uh, desires because there are excellent they are excellent customers. So for purely uh, economic reasons, uh, Biden is is torn. I, I mean, the political opinion within the Democratic Party has shifted very much in recent years, more and more towards critical voices against Israeli occupation and apartheid. But uh, the business interests of the arms industry are still very much on the pro-Israeli side. Before we close out, I do want to touch on the BDS movement. That is, of course, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. I want to focus on Europe and in particular in Germany. So last time we interviewed you, you explained the significance of the 2020 ruling of the European Court of Human Rights. And that was considered a victory for the BDS movement and specifically for the activists in France. We also examined in depth the German parliament's passing of a resolution that condemned the BDS movement. Do you have any updates for us? on this matter? Yeah, uh, there is a lawsuit against the German uh, parliament condemning this uh, resolution because the uh, academic or, or the scientific research center of the German parliament, of the Bundestag, issued a research report that showed that the anti-BDS resolution of the German parliament violates the German constitution. And based on that finding, activists who have been silenced, who have been denied public funding for their whatever projects they had, they have been denied rooms in order to hold, to hold political events, in the name of that resolution of the parliament against BDS, have la launched a lawsuit. And the, the parliament, the German parliament responded to the court, to the lawsuit by saying, we don't think that a, a court decision is necessary because the resolution is simply a statement, it has no legal standing which is a very interesting statement. On one hand, they are admitting that they cannot actually ban people from boycotting Israel. And that, that is a severe limitation on freedom of speech, on economic freedom, people can make their own decisions. But they also uh, are very much um, unable to find any arguments to justify how, how, why they would say that BDS is anti-Semitic when it's very clear that it is not. Uh, and um, and many uh, progressive human rights organizations are supporting BDS. We have the new uh, resolution of the, the, the new research by Human Rights Watch, and also by uh, and the largest Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, that sh says that Israel is an apartheid state. And they prove it. Uh, it's, uh, these reports are very clear. Now, if uh, a boycott was a legitimate means to protest against uh, apartheid in South Africa. Why, why wouldn't it be a legitimate means to protest uh, apartheid in Israel, Palestine? Uh, 
I think uh, uh, it's quite clear. But I do think that uh, the, this attack that we've seen now on Gaza, because it makes Hamas stronger and because Hamas is a much stronger opponent to BDS than uh, the German government or the Israeli government, Hamas is really able to, to uh, weaken BDS by saying we don't need any kind of nonviolent measures, we want to focus on violent measures, uh, then that sort of attack does indeed uh, make it uh, easier f f to suppress the BDS movement. And um, there's one uh, German scholar who recently said, you know, what should Palestinians do? They're being a, a, the Hamas party is accused of, of uh, being a terrorist organization that fires rockets on Israel. But if they are not allowed to do BDS because the German government says that it's anti-Semitic, uh, then what are their options? And, and I think that's a very important uh, thing to understand, that by supporting BDS, we're actually trying to shift the, the parameters of the whole conflict and to make it into uh, an issue of, of rights, of basic human rights. Dr. Shear Hever, thank you, and it was great to have you back on the program. Thank you, David. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for watching this episode of The Source. Activism Munich will continue to keep you all updated on this ongoing situation, so please make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. And if you're able to and you like the work that we do here, please donate to our organization so we can continue with our independent news and analysis. Activism Munich receives no corporate money or government funding, so we depend on your donations and your support to keep us going. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.